and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. I'm happy to start off the briefing with news that the American Rescue Plan, or ARP, benefit extension payments are already being paid to people, including to people who had exhausted their PUA or PEUC claims. With more counties lifting restrictions and vaccines becoming available to more Oregonians, we're increasing our focus on helping workers get back to their jobs or find new career opportunities. One year into the pandemic, we have insights on the industries that have had the most job openings for workers in Oregon. While hiring continued across all broad sectors of Oregon's economy last year in 2020, it was at a lower level than we would have liked. Employers hired for many types of work with vacancies in more than 350 different occupations. The occupations with the highest number of job vacancies in 2020 reflected all of us living during a pandemic. Transportation and material moving occupations were in the highest demand. Truck drivers were the most notable. Oregon had more job vacancies for heavy truck drivers than for any other single occupation in 2020. But even in this time of heightened remote work, three out of four jobs nationally have not been able to telework at all during the pandemic. In Oregon, office and grounds cleaning occupations had 22% more openings in 2020 compared to the year before. This is likely due to heightened demand for cleaning services related to COVID-19 protocols. Employers reported difficulty filling about half of their job vacancies in 2020. They tended to have more difficulty hiring for jobs like truck drivers that require particular types of training beyond high school. They had less difficulty reported with filling the many jobs that opened up to stock store shelves, fill orders, and serve customers in fast food establishments. Unsurprisingly, when we look at the industry level picture in Oregon, healthcare had the most vacancies in 2020 and consistently leads in terms of hiring demand. It had the most job openings in 2020 of any industry, and that's been a long running trend. We also expect that to continue into the future since healthcare is projected to grow at the fastest rate of any broad sector in Oregon by 2029. The governor released her 10 point economic plan this week and the employment department is proud to be a central component of that 10 point economic recovery plan. A key priority is supporting every Oregonian whose employment has been impacted by the pandemic. That means extending the critical unemployment benefits that so many are relying on and providing the assistance and tools that will allow the unemployed to get back to work. The devastating impact of the pandemic has disproportionately hurt many people who face economic and other forms of discrimination. We're helping to push for racial justice and equity and to help provide new skills and opportunities so people impacted by discrimination can take advantage of career growth that arises as our economy evolves during this recovery period. The Employment Department's Workforce Operations Division is working hard to make sure our job seeker services fit the demands and needs of our new reality. That means partnering with nonprofit organizations, other state agencies, and local organizations to offer virtual services and provide more skills training for different occupations that either are or will be in demand in specific regions of the state. And our research division provides key data and analysis that can guide people back to work. In fact, we're helping the governor's Racial Justice Council use data to support economic prosperity for communities of color. Our research division also provides quality information for businesses, economists, and others so they can make informed choices and help grow our economy throughout the state. I wanted to talk about the federal benefit programs. And as I mentioned a bit ago, we're happy to report that we had started paying the American Rescue Plan benefit extensions on time for pandemic unemployment assistance, PEUC, and the weekly $300 federal pandemic unemployment compensation benefits. And when we talk about paying these benefits on, my, on time, we mean that we've started paying them for the first week the ARP benefits are available, the week starting March 14th. We estimate about 27,000 Oregonians exhausted their claims or reached a zero balance before the ARP benefit extensions began on March 14th. The ARP did provide more benefits to people but only allows those new benefits to be paid for weeks starting March 14th, 2021 or later. 
people who used up all of their PUA or PUC benefits before that can get the new ARP benefits starting for the week of March 14th. Unfortunately, some people used their benefits up weeks ago, so will not be able to get benefits for some weeks prior to March 14th because the American Recovery Plan Act or Rescue Plan Act does not allow us to pay those benefits prior to March 14th. Now that we have begun paying all of the benefit programs under the ARP extensions, we're shifting our focus to the next item on our priority list, and that's implementing the MEUC or Mixed Earner Unemployment Compensation Program. That program provides an additional $100 per week for people who are receiving regular UI benefits and had at least $5,000 in self-employment income. Our goal is to begin paying these benefits by the end of April, including any retroactive benefits people are eligible for. We will soon have more information about the MEUC program, including eligibility guidelines and instructions for claimants. Please make sure to follow us on social media and sign up for email updates so that you can stay updated on our progress. Ensuring equal access to our programs is part of living our agency values of respect, integrity, and community. Today, we're glad to be launching an online Spanish language initial claim form for people who are applying for regular unemployment insurance benefits. This is available through our online claim system and makes benefits more accessible for Spanish speakers. Our press release will be issued later today with more information about this exciting release. The Continued Assistance Act required that we receive proof of employment or self-employment for everybody applying for PUA benefits or people that are already receiving PUA benefits. If people do not provide the required information by a certain time frame, and that time frame can vary from claim to claim, the federal law requires us to stop their payments and to consider some previously made benefit payments to be overpayments. As we're reviewing documents people have submitted, we're notifying people whether their documents meet the federal requirements. More of these notifications will be issued in the days and weeks to come. We know that this new requirement and the related deadlines have been confusing. Earlier this year, we created an interactive tool to help people figure out what information they need to provide and by when. You can find that tool at our ARP page where you can scroll down to the PUA section and find interactive tool. We understand there's a lot of information out there about different benefit programs that the information changes and it's hard to keep track of what you need to do to continue receiving benefits. We're going to continue to provide additional information as it becomes available. As the federal deadlines for people to provide us information are reached, some people who applied for PUA benefits on or after January 31st of this year have not yet provided the required documentation. In those circumstances, people will receive a decision explaining why they are no longer able to receive PUA benefits. And in some cases, they will also receive notice of any PUA benefits that are required to be considered overpayments. It's very important that people upload their proof of employment or self-employment after logging into the online claim system to avoid these potential challenges to receiving benefits. For more information about the PUA proof of employment or self-employment requirement, please visit our PUA FAQs or use the interactive tool on our website. Unemployment insurance fraud continues to be a concern and our dedicated team is actively preventing, detecting and investigating it every day. We know we're not sharing the specific information that some people would like to see, but we take very seriously our obligation to protect public dollars and safeguard Oregon's trust fund. Some states do share information about fraud and many states like us do not. The more we share about fraud, the more risk that poses for the trust fund. And unemployment insurance fraud is a serious national issue. In a recent joint letter, the National Governors Association and the National Association of State Workforce Agencies urged the federal government to take more action to address this national problem at the federal level. We continue partnering with state workforce agencies around the country, with the US Department of Labor, with law enforcement and with media also. You have all been very helpful in sharing tips and information about how Oregonians can help protect themselves. We're building on and improving our fraud detection and prevention tools, 
including partnering with other companies and learning from our peer organizations throughout the nation. For some people, learning that someone used their stolen identity to try to get unemployment benefits is how they first learned their identity was stolen. Unfortunately, criminals are using stolen identities from past national data breaches to commit fraud. This is a frightening situation for people whose information was stolen in the past and a threat to the unemployment system that we take very seriously. We do ask that in any coverage of fraud, you include some resources and steps people can take. If somebody receives mail from the employment department that they should not have received, please return it to us right away. We encourage everyone to report identity theft or any knowledge of fraud or suspected fraud at unemployment.organ.gov. You can type in ID theft or fraud and you'll be directed to our reporting forms. You can also use our fraud hotline, which is dedicated just to receiving reports about possible unemployment fraud. That is 1-877-668-3204. And we're working to compile additional answers to frequently asked questions and other resources related to fraud, identity theft, and other online scams. With the state legislature in session, there are bills that would impact the work the employment department does. We know that the pandemic has had a large impact on employers, and even though business is picking back up, many employers are still struggling. We know that they need relief and wanna do what we can to help. We came up with a solution that lets businesses that saw their unemployment insurance tax rate increase by half a percent or more in 2021 to defer a third of this year's payments until June of 2022. And we're happy to see that a group of legislators has introduced new legislation that is focused on providing even more payroll tax relief to employers impacted by COVID-19. We continue to work with legislators and employer groups to protect the solvency of the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund and to provide assistance to employers impacted by COVID-19. Our next webinar will be on Thursday, April 1st. It will be in Spanish and will focus on the American Rescue Plan benefit extensions, expired claims, PUA expansion, and the new online initial claim application in Spanish. To register for the webinar or to view all of the past webinars, you can go to unemployment.organ.gov slash webinars. And to share some information about the amount of benefits being paid, from March 15th of 2020 through March 23rd of 2021, the Employment Department has paid $8.3 billion in benefits. That covers more than 12.2 million weeks of benefits being paid. And we continue to pay a lot of benefits each week. Last week, it was about $132 million to 163,000 people. The total benefits we have paid includes $691 million to well over 100,000 people in PUA benefits. To close, we know uh, how thankful people are to be receiving additional benefits and we're very glad that we're paying the benefit extensions on time with no disruption for most people. We know there are still some who have not received all of their benefits yet and we're working to minimize any disruption and get all benefits paid to people as quickly as we can. We know how important these benefits are. We also know how important it is for people to have the best up-to-date information on these many different and changing programs. We will be adding more customer-facing communication to our website in the days to come. We're looking forward to helping more people get back to work in the workforce and working with our many partners to make that happen. And I would like to send a heartfelt thanks to our employees who continue working weekends and being incredibly dedicated to make sure these ARP benefit extensions could be paid out on time. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Now we are opening the lines to members of the media to ask questions. We will call on you in the order you RSVP'd. And remember, if you are joining us by phone, be sure to hit star six to unmute yourself. If you don't get your questions answered, please email oed underscore communications at oregon.gov. And the first one up is Peter Wong from Pamplin Media. Go ahead, Peter. Hi, David. Uh, one small question, one large question. MEUC, which you said uh, uh, is scheduled to use during those payments in April, uh, 
was that also continued under the American Rescue Plan? I know there was some question about that and I did amend the story when it was not clear whether it was either ending with a continued assistance act or not. Uh, sure, thank you. And I, I think when you asked that question last time, I wasn't quite certain um, and apologize if that was uh, a problem. We have confirmed that the MEUC program was extended under the ARP. So that also will continue to be available to eligible people through September 4th of this year. Okay. Uh, the bill in the legislature you referenced, uh, House Bill 3389 is up for public hearing next week. And you mentioned one of the provisions. Can you explain about the other provisions? One changes the horizon from 10 to 20 years. That's for the uh, uh, trust fund, I believe. And the other one would, uh, it has to do with rates for 2021, 22, and 23 being based on the 2020 rates, which if I remember our previous discussions at these availabilities, uh, 2020 rates were only partly affected by the, uh, the downturn. Uh, I'm just looking more for an explanation, no advocacy or anything like that, but those, those two other uh, uh, provisions are in the uh, drafted bill. Sure, and, and the bill has a number of different provisions related to unemployment insurance tax that take kind of um, different approaches at providing relief while also uh, protecting the solvency of the trust fund. The first change that you asked about, the change from 10 to 20 years, there's a formula in statute that is used to determine uh, how much gets collected in taxes each year. And part of that formula includes looking back over the prior 10 years to look at what the largest amount of benefits was that had to be paid and making sure that we target our reserves to be able to deal with a recession like that going forward. This bill would change that from looking back 10 years to 20 years. And the reason to do that is we've just had two economic growth cycles in a row where we were right on the verge of having more than 10 years of growth, which would mean that the trust funds reserves would essentially forget that a recession had happened and increase the risk that we wouldn't have enough reserves when a downturn took place. So that uh, provision is in there to try to make sure that that doesn't happen going forward and that we have more long-term solvency in the trust fund. Okay, the, I understand that. The other change that you asked about uh, is talking about using the employer experience ratings from 2020 to determine tax rates for 2022 through 2024. And the experience ratings that were used to determine 2020 tax rates didn't have any of the pandemic experience in it. So this would be a way of really not uh, not taking the pandemic experience into account when looking at the employer's experience rating. In normal times, that experience rating means that businesses that tend to have more layoffs or unemployed workers tend to have higher tax rates. And this is a recognition that the pandemic was not a typical situation. And to try to take out the impact of that pandemic uh, from influencing employers' experience ratings. Okay. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Next up is Keaton Thomas from KATU. Go ahead, Keaton. Hey, David, a uh, similar question for you. Uh, I did speak with Representative Holvey the other day about that bill, um, one of the sponsors. And I guess one of the things that I asked him and I wanted to ask you too is to what capacity does this new bill in the legislature affect long-term solvency of the UI trust fund? So it does make some changes to the long-term funding formula. Uh, and we provided some technical assistance to the legislature about what we thought provided um, relief while also making sure that there wasn't a, a, any significant risk of insolvency. And I mentioned that formula, it is a um, pretty um, detailed set of computations that gets done to figure out individual tax schedules. But the change that this bill would make is really to reduce the overall reserve target, essentially. 
And from looking at Oregon's experience in the Great Recession and during this historic level recession, where we've had sufficient reserves and currently um, enough reserves that we're able to use some of that to provide short-term relief to employers, it does look like there is room to lower the reserve target, which means lowering the amount of money that needs to be brought in without creating any significant increase in the risk of insolvency. Uh, overall, the bill would make about a 10% reduction in the solvency level. It's not spread evenly over all of the different scenarios though. So it would tend to um, provide more relief and have us in lower tax schedules longer uh, and mitigate having such drastic upswings when we do have a severe recession. So it, it would reduce kind of the long-term target for reserves, but we do not see this causing any long-term threat of insolvency. And besides having some uh, great in-house experts, we're also consulting with people at the national level to make sure that, that they agree that this still keeps Oregon having uh, one of the nation's most solvent trust funds, and we think that it will. Uh, and to follow up, um, we obviously this is like very technical, and I think the general public largely has no clue how this works. And so I guess what I wanted to ask you is in the simplest, most basic way possible, what is the impact of this on the business community in Oregon? Like, are we going to be talking about like, wild swings to where they were paying a lot to now they're playing none to paying very little, like just in very simple terms, what is going to be the impact of this on the business community in Oregon? So I'll, I'll try to give you an answer. And I'll also tell you that I may not be the best at putting it in really simple terms, but we are working as we're analyzing this to get some information um, ready to, to share with the public and with Oregon businesses. But at, at a high level, what it will do is it will, um, it will provide some short-term immediate relief in 2021 for businesses that saw their tax rates go up, their unemployment tax rates. It would let them um, defer a lot of their taxes for this year. And then the businesses that saw significant tax rate increases would then have some of those deferred taxes forgiven. So it's some immediate short-term relief, turning some of that into uh, longer-term relief also, and then doing some reforms to the long-term structure so that there, uh, it is a little bit more stable over the long-term and we're not aiming for such a high level of reserves necessarily. So I think it will be that short-term relief uh, and long-term really protecting the solvency and, and ensuring that it stays steady. That's great, thank you so much. Next up is L Lindsay Nadwich with COIN. Hi, David. Um, I spoke to a woman today. She was on regular unemployment benefits uh, and then PEUC. She says she exhausted her benefits. So her claim expired March 13th. She's been filed a new claim and she has not yet received uh, any additional payment. So uh, can you explain why someone maybe didn't get a payment? I know you said you started making payments through ARP. Uh, she says she didn't get a payment. She wants to know why and when she might be able to expect a payment since she didn't get one. Sure. So I, I can't give you a specific about her situation without knowing more information. But one of the possible scenarios is it, it sounds like she did use up her regular benefits and was just applying for the PEUC extension. Um, we are required before we pay someone on PEUC to confirm that they're not eligible for any new claim. Uh, so it may be that her initial claim is still being reviewed to ensure that, for instance, there's not out-of-state wages or eligibility for regular unemployment, whether in Oregon or any other state in the nation, uh, and then the PEUC benefits would start. And, and I would say it sounds like she exhausted her claim on March 13th, um, which was right as the um, Continued Assistance Act programs expired and filed her new claim about 10 days ago. So we are processing most initial claims very quickly within about four days. Um, sometimes it does take a little bit longer and if we're having to do the initial claim processing and then also initiate the PEUC claim, it may take a few extra days. 
Um, so she said she was on PUC and that's what expired, I believe. But um, as far as, you know, verifying some of that information, shouldn't you guys already know that? Like she hasn't worked in a year and was collecting unemployment benefits for a year. And I know a lot of people are in that situation and are wondering why they have to start over um, with that process when they were already in, have been in the system for a year. Right. And that, that's really the federal requirements tell us that we have to do that. Um, and they have been very explicit that before we uh, either start paying someone under PEUC or PUA um, and at each quarter change and when certain other events take place, we're required to reevaluate their claim to make sure that they're not eligible for regular unemployment. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are some situations, for instance, if somebody had work in another state that we might not know of, or if they had intermittent periods of being unemployed and working, that may actually have been enough as time goes on to qualify them for another regular claim. But the, the bottom line is that federal law requires that we do that. So we're doing that and we're making the process go as quickly as we can. Lastly, can you do you have any estimate for someone like that who isn't didn't get the initial payments and does have a gap in benefits? Is there any time estimate for when they they should be expected to get their payment, and then when will MEUC start? So the in terms of the the how long it will take when there is uh, where they haven't yet received their benefits, it's really hard to say without knowing the individual circumstances. For instance, if it's someone that is eligible for benefits under a, a claim in another state, um, we would need to tell them that they might have to actually apply in the other state, which is what the federal law would require. Depending on what the issue is, we are resolving things pretty quickly, but it's really hard to give one answer. For the MEUC payment start date, uh, we are on, uh, we're aiming towards beginning to make all of those payments by the end of April. Uh, we had been targeting an earlier date, and then with the federal legislation, we uh, had to kind of pause that work to roll out these new ARP extensions. So we're already back at the work for MEUC and hope to have more detailed updates as we get farther into doing that work. Okay, thanks. Next up is Angelina Dixon from KVAL. Angelina Dixon from KVAL. Okay. We'll come back around. Dick Hughes from the Hughesisms. Thank you very much for doing these as always. Uh, David, I'd like to ask a more general uh, grassroots question. What are your, what is your staff telling you that uh, the concerns that most that they're hearing uh, from people, um, sort of, you've got so many programs going. Uh, what are what are the issues that you know the frontline workers are are hearing about? You know, it. it I, I think you kind of hit on it with the point that there's a lot of different programs, um, and kind of as I alluded to in the response to Lindsay's question, there's a lot of different situations that people are in. And I think the most common theme would probably be people being confused and just worried about uh, what's going to happen to their particular situation. Uh, it, it's not that there's one body of work that needs to be done and one answer. It's people um, knowing that there are multiple different programs uh, and that the rules have changed over the past year. So we know that it is confusing. One of the things that we're working on is creating better tools to try to explain that better. Uh, and, and we know that there are likely to be ongoing changes as we get new federal guidance and potentially more state and federal legislation. So we're really focused on trying to make that as understandable as possible. So I, I think those are the biggest questions that our uh, employees are getting is, is around that theme of just not knowing exactly what needs to happen for their particular situation. And it's something that we're really focused on supporting our staff because they they want to be able to give that quick, solid, definite answer to, to help the person that's on the line. Thank you. Uh, then a follow-up question related to uh, federal legislation. Um, 
Senator Wyden in particular has a variety of, of bills and proposals going forward. Have you heard more from him on uh, his proposals for um, centralized uh, IT for uh, unemployment systems throughout the nation or uh, other the various proposals he's put forth? Sure, they had some, some really general discussions and talked about a couple of details there. I, I think that uh, some of his proposals are things that have um, th that our agency has advocated for for a long time. And I think his office has advocated for for a long time to provide long term reforms, for instance, to have permanent extension programs. I think the push around creating a more nationalized focus on the technology to support the payments and programs and potentially even a more centralized approach around some parts of how the, the program actually works it is a newer topic that's come up as a result of all states in the nation having challenges during the pandemic. So we've had some discussions and I think there's a lot of interest around that and a lot of exploring what those possibilities might be. And or Oregon certainly wants to be part of that. We wanna see the best way that we can be part of a, a streamlined system um, and make sure that we're able to preserve some of the really unique things in Oregon that have been a huge benefit over the many decades, like the, the strong work share program, self-employment assistance program. Um, we've talked about the trust fund and we would wanna make sure, for instance, that if there is some nationalization, that it doesn't do anything to put at risk our solvent trust fund. Thank you. Next up is Tom Cusack from the Oregon Housing Blog. Hey, David, can you, can you hear me, David? I can. Uh, I've got a couple questions related to uh, unemployed workers as opposed to employers in terms of tax savings. Um, my recollection is the rescue plan has a provision that allows at the federal level an exemption of something like $10,000 in unemployment income. Do any of the bills that you've heard discussed in Oregon provide for any relief from income taxes for Oregon income taxes for uh, people who receive benefits during 2020? I haven't seen a bill introduced that has that. I, I do know that some legislators are interested in that and that that's being looked at, but I don't know if that um, has been introduced or will make it into any kind of legislative proposal. Okay, my follow-up question has to do with another provision uh, that basically would provide some enhanced healthcare subsidies for unemployed workers during 2021 only. Uh, I know that your agency obviously is not gonna be in charge of administering that, but my question is, do you have an existing data sharing arrangement that would allow you to let the health authority know who has in fact received unemployment insurance during uh, during this year? Sure, so, so our agency has data sharing arrangements with a number of agencies. Um, we're, we're always very cautious about maintaining the security and confidentiality, but federal law, uh, and state law permits and actually requires us to share that information to help some other programs, including the provision of uh, healthcare assistance. So we do have data sharing agreements um, and certainly are, are happy to talk with our sister agencies about what types of information they need and to do whatever we can to help them get the benefits that they can provide to people out as quickly as possible. 